You can get saved. It ain't hard. It ain't hard. And there is a fountain filled with blood. It's drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Still and always will lose all their guilty stains. If you've got your Bible, open it with me to the book of Matthew in chapter 14. I want to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost tonight. I don't want to grieve God. I really do feel like God's a drawing on somebody's heart. And let's say that you could have got saved before now. Because he's speaking. That Bible said to seek him while he be found and call on him while he's near. It said let the wicked forsake his way. Right. And if you get to that place, you could get saved. Amen. 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 Matthew chapter number 14. And let's look just at a few verses of scripture. I'll not labor you. I feel like God's a moving. I don't want to get in his way. But I want, to, I want to say a few things, maybe pick up from a comment that I made last night and then something that the preacher said this evening. The Bible said in verse number 22, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray when the evening was come, he was there alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea, the very same storm I talked about last night. The Bible said when the disciples saw him walking upon the sea, or walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. You better listen, he's still saying come. He opened the invitation in Genesis when he was standing upon the ark and he looked out to Noah and he said, come thou and all thy family. He, was, he said, come. You say, why is that important? Had everything to do with where Christ was. Right. I'm glad he didn't look at Noah and say, go. Because if he'd have said go, that would have meant he was sending Noah in the ark to go through that flood by himself. But that's not what he said. He said, come. In other words, I'm in the ark and I want you in here with me. He opened that invitation in Genesis. But may I say to you, it's still open in Revelation 22. He said, let the spirit and the bride say, come. And he still is saying, come tonight. And if you die without Christ, it'll be because you didn't come. And he said, Peter, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him. Let me preach for just a few minutes on this thought. Drowning in arm's length of the master of the sea. Here he is, the Bible said, that he was beginning to sink, but immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and he, and he, and he pulled him out of the water. Yeah. I was reading I, this, this word, it said beginning to sink. He was drowning. He was beginning to drown right there in the presence of the Son of God. I read when I began to study this thought a little bit about drowning, I began to do some study about physical drowning and I found some very interesting similarities from what I would say a spiritual drowning and physical drowning. I read where a young captain was taking 
over a ship and the older captain was retiring and uh, the older man took the younger man on the boat and they began to sail down the coast, not way out into the water, but just right off the bar. And they were sailing down uh, on the side of the reef when all of a sudden that young captain piled off the boat, dove into the water, and began swimming toward a boat that was anchored in shallow water. There was a husband and a wife out there. The, the, the boat was, uh, it had been anchored down and was just floating nearby. And that mom and dad were playing in the water. It was about uh, chest deep water and they were splashing one another and uh, they were flailing their arms around and they were hollering and playing. And uh, they noticed this young man. He began to, uh, that young captain began to swim toward him. Uh, and he was swimming with great speed and great effort. And all of a sudden, that little lady looked toward her husband and said, uh, I believe that man thinks we're in trouble. I believe that man coming toward us believes that we're drowning. And they began to try to wave him off and tell him uh, uh, that they were all right. But that man just kept swimming. Uh, and he swam and he swam right. But between uh, oh, that husband and wife, they swam 10 foot on the other side of where that husband and wife were swimming uh, and he went down into the water uh, and he pulled out a little nine year old girl. Uh, uh, their little girl was drowning just on the other side uh, of where they were swimming. Uh, uh, not a sound was made. Uh, uh, she wasn't frail in the water. She wasn't screaming. Uh, uh, but 10 foot inside of her mom and dad, uh, uh, that little girl had gone down beneath the water and it had not been for a trained eye that little girl would have drowned and her parents would have never known it. And that rescue, that, coast, he, that captain was a former Coast Guard rescue swimmer and he went down underneath the water and pulled the little girl up. And the first thing she said when she got her breath, she screamed, Daddy, and that daddy was shamed. He said, I want you to tell me what you could see from a hundred yards away that I couldn't see 10 feet away from my own daughter. What could you see? See, the difference was that Coast Guard rescue swimmer had been trained by the experts. He had been trained what to notice when a person was drowning and that dad had learned what, what drowning looked like from television. That dad thought drowning was frailing the water and screaming, I'm drowning, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. Oh, but if you'll read out to the experts, they say very rarely is there ever a drowning incident or where the person drowning makes any noise. And people say, well, if people just ask for help, I'd help them. Man, if they'd just reach out to me, I'd help them. And I wonder who's sitting down the pew tonight from you. They're not making any noise and they're not frailing. They're not beating the water or they're not waving their hands saying, I need help. Oh, but they're sitting there quietly. Oh, they're sitting there make, making any sound. And neighbor, if they don't get some help and get some help soon, oh, they're gonna be like the little girl. They're gonna drown beside you and you're never gonna know anything's wrong. And some of you are sitting there and you're the one doing the drowning. And you wish you could frail. You wish you could say a word. But you can't. Some of you wish you could just slip your hand over there to your husband or slip your hand over there to your wife. But you can't. You're close to help. That little girl was 10 foot from her daddy. I'll never forget. You said, don't that, would that dad not have, I remember years ago, Brother Ron, Brother Edgar said he, li he lived out on Lake Lanier. He lived up on a hill and you could sit on his porch and you could see down the lake and he said, I'll never forget. He said, I remember, I remember seeing, I was sitting on my porch looking down through there and I remember seeing a family go down uh, uh, to play on the boat ramp and to swim in the boat ramp. Oh, when all of a sudden he said a little girl, the little girl of the family uh, got in distress and she was going under the water and said the daddy couldn't swim. 
And that daddy couldn't swim, but said he loved his little girl so much oh, that he went out there into the water where she was to try to rescue her. Oh, but the little girl pulled the daddy under. And Brother Edgar said, I sat there on my porch and watched them drag both bodies out of the water and lay them on the boat ramp. Oh, what love that father must have had for that little girl, oh, knowing that he couldn't swim to go into that water. Oh, but can I tell you, you may be drowning tonight, oh, but thank God I serve of God uh, that he does know how to swim. He does know how to rescue you and you may feel like you're going down for the last time but thank God I serve a God who can get to where you are. And pulled them out and laid them down. But can I tell you the difference? The God in heaven I serve died before you ever got in trouble. Amen. He laid his life down for you before you ever got in distress. Yes, he did. There's some of you youngins, pressure's on you. The world's pulling at you. Your friends are pulling at you. And it seems like that weight's laid down on you. Can I tell you, if you don't let God pull you out, you'll sink. That's right. You can't bear up. It doesn't matter how beautiful you are. It doesn't matter how athletically Amen. skilled you are. It doesn't matter how prominent your parents are. It doesn't matter how poor your parents are. I'm telling you, this weight will get on you and take you out of the water before you ever realize it's on Yes, sir. Praise God. Re- they said, you understand that drowning is the second leading killer of children. Only behind automobile accidents. 750 kids will drown this year. And they said 375 of them will do it within 25 foot of their parents. And they said sometimes the parents are watching and never know a thing's wrong. And I wonder how many times we fill a pulpit and we preach and I'm looking across a congregation and if I'm not praying and feel the Holy Ghost, God, I won't see what's going on. I mean, I've asked the Lord for discernment. If I'm asking for anything, God, give me discernment. And Lord, point some out that are drowning so that I can do my best to pull them out of the fire and to pull them out of the water, neighbor. I don't want to be like a parent that's watching their children drown and not know anything's going wrong. There's something called the instinctive drowning response. And that's what people go through when they really start to drown. And they say, why can't people scream? Why can't my children, hey mom and dad, why can't my kids just reach out to me? I'll help them. I preach to youth pastor. You tell them young people, they say, well, preacher, they'll just ask me. I'm here to help them. God, help. Why don't you walk with the Lord and get somewhere with God? Let God the Holy Ghost tell you something's wrong. Good preacher. Amen. If they'll just ask. But somebody that's drowning, they physically can't speak. Because they say, brother Larry, when they come out of the water, that their body... Is in, a, is in a way that the only thing they do when their head comes back above the water that all they can do is that they can't exhale, inhale, and speak. All their body's trying to do is get one more breath. And you may have come to church tonight and you're trying to get one more breath. You say, preacher, I wish I could wave at you and tell you that I need the Lord. But they say when somebody's drowning, they can't, they can't wave because their hands automatically go to the side and they're trying to push their body up. You're right. And they can't stop good. and wave. They said once somebody gets in that instinctive drowning response, once that begins, they've got, you've got 20 to 60 seconds to get to them before they're gone forever. God help our generation of preachers to start preaching with some urgency again that people really die without God and go to hell. 
It's not about the spotlight. It's not about a platform. It's not about a poster. It's not about being said you can preach in this meeting or that meeting. God help, that's so long gone. If it was just that, I'd be in Georgia tonight preaching at the Wahoo Baptist Church and go home and sleep with my wife and kiss my boys goodnight. But God help, a burning on the inside of me, Brother Jared, is a reality of that men, women, boys, and girls, if they don't get born again, are gonna die and spend eternity forever in hell. And son, I wouldn't be much of a preacher if I didn't have a burden for young boys like you, young ladies like you, that might be within arm's length of help, but they're drowning. Amen. Amen. It's right. I feel like I'm doing the will of God, Brother Jared. They tell me that 75% of preschoolers who drown do so in less than five minutes after they were seen. And I wonder, Mom and Dad, you look at them children every day and the world's pulling at them and the world's pulling at them. That's good, Mom and Dad, if there's ever been a day we ought to walk filled with the Spirit of God, it's in this day. Yes, we sat with a preacher at lunch today, Brother Jerry. He said the greatest burden of his life was not his church. It was not the ministry. He said the greatest burden of my life is my two daughters. Did he not? Two daughters. What good would it be for me to win everybody else's children right. and watch my two boys miss God and go to hell? That's good. Amen. You think I'd stand in front of the great white, or in front of the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord be pleased that I want everybody else's children and watch mine die without God? They live in the preacher's home, both of them. Hey, Brother Jason, both of them live within 20, I mean, sleep within 25 foot of where I lay my head down at night and these kids are drowning within 25 feet of their parents. God, help my boys can die and go to hell where they sleep. That close to help. I learned that most children drown in safe places, bathtubs, toilets, buckets and some of you think because you're in a safe place that you're okay but there's a whole lot of children going to die this year and they're going to drown not on the angry ocean in a tornado but they're going to drown in a bathtub something that they take part in every day That's good. Right. yes sir the greatest age is at most danger, one to four, zero to four, and 14 to 18. What about that? Sober, isn't it? Come here, little man, help me. You say, what are you trying to do tonight? Just stand right there, stand right down there. Stand right down there. Put your hands up. Put both your hands up. Put them together. You say, what are you doing? I'm trying to pull you out of the water. And I get one pulled out, I'm going to go back over and I'm going to try to pull somebody else out. People say, you're trying to scare God. If I can scare your kids out of hell, you better believe I'll do it. Hey, why is it okay if the football coach puts pressure on your boy? Why is it okay for the chemistry teacher to put pressure on your children? Why is it all right for the teacher to push them? Oh, but when the man of God tries to keep them out of hell and puts a little pressure on them, we get all nervous. Hey, if they fail chemistry, they can still go to heaven. Hey, if they miss out on the ball field, they can still go to heaven. Oh, honey, if they don't come to God, they'll die without Christ. Yes, sir. Praise God. Thank you, buddy. Let me tell you, look at your text. I read 
they gave some figures from the United, the, the United Kingdom. And they said 90%. Let me just, let me, let me get it right here. It said 66% of drowners were good swimmers. And they drowned within 10 feet of safety. Right. 10 feet. That's not much more than that right there. That's how close you can be to safety and miss God. Let me give you four things and I'm done. Number one, in our text, there was a problem that was urgent. He was beginning to sink. He's walking out there on the water, the waves are rolling, and all of a sudden his feet began to sink underneath the water. Let me ask you something. How long do you think it took Peter to get real serious about the situation he was in? I don't believe he had to wait till his mouth was underneath the water. I don't believe he had to wait till his head was underneath the water. I believe he knew when his feet began to sink that soon, or very soon behind that, may I tell you, young person, uh, uh, the reason kids don't get saved uh, is because they don't think their condition is urgent. They think you got plenty of time, uh, or you think you're not in danger yet, but can I tell you, oh, it may not seem urgent right now, uh, uh, but if you're not careful, you'll get in a place you'll think you'll never get out, but you don't have to wait that long. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir, brother. When you, get, when you get scared of drowning, you'll call on God. Amen. That's right. That's right. Amen. That's good. It was urgent. But Jason, my you young years, you could preach on hell and young people were still moved by it. But they done cut enough heads off of demons on the Sega and the Xbox and the PS4 and everything else. They're not afraid of hell because they think they've seen it on the television screen. That's good. That's good. Amen. That's good. Amen. And every other movie's about the underworld Amen. and a demon and a devil. Right. Let me tell you something, son. If, it, if the half's not been told about heaven, I'm convinced the half's not been told about hell. That's good. That's right. And how awful is it going to be? Sweetheart, stick your arm out. Look at there. Look how close. Look how close Peter was. But he was still drowning. Yes. Amen. That close. Yes, sir. But still drowning. Boys, I was at the football game the other day. I watched them lay the, in the nose of the football up against the, up against the end zone line. But you know what? As close as that ball was, I don't believe they could have put it any closer without it being a touchdown. But with it being that close, that team still didn't score. And how off is it going to be to ride the bus to church? Go to youth activities. That's good. Amen. Bring your children to church. Yes, be a good mother and be a good dad, but be that close and still drown. Yeah. Right. See, it's not urgent in America anymore. It may get urgent before we get out of here. Amen. Amen. A problem that was urgent, but then there was a proximity that was underestimated. Brother Larry, Peter thought it was okay because he was close. Oh, yeah. He thought because he was that close, he was okay. Yeah. Come here, Bubba. Come here and help me again. Come here and help me again. Some of you are real close to godly parents. Come here and help me. Come up here. Let's come up here. Everybody see. I preached on Samson Monday night. Samson's in the jail grinding. And a little Philistine boy was taking care of him. And that little lad took, that little lad was holding the hand of one of the greatest heroes of the Bible. That little Philistine boy. And that little, Samson looked at him and said, and let me just say this, I know I'm not purple right now and water's not dripping off my face like it normally is when I preach, but I am still preaching. I would rather preach that way, but God's put me in a different gear. Go ahead. Good, brother. And Samson told that little boy, he said, take me over there to those pillars and put my hands on them. 
And that little boy led the, led the giant, one of the giant heroes of the Bible over there. It's all right. I ain't going to let nobody get you. Come on up here with me. And he took his hands and he put them on there. But here's the kicker that nobody wants to think about. When Samson pushed the pillars and the house fell, that little boy was a Philistine. And that little boy died without God. Standing right beside one of the greatest heroes of the Bible. Amen. He died holding the hand of a hero. Thank you, Bo. Somebody give me some dollars. Give me, give me two or three dollars. Somebody give me two or three dollars. Babs. Come here, Bob. Thank you for helping. <laughs> he appreciates that offering, praise God. That's good. Amen. Come here, Bob. You and that, you come here. Good strapping young man. He could love that preacher. He could be near that preacher. He could be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, go to every youth function, tell the preacher how much he loves him and be that close. But still miss heaven. That little, you, you may be his hero. He ought to be. Let me just say a word right there. That man of God that keeps hell prayed off of you ought to be your hero, not some half-dressed something or another out of Hollywood or some ball player that wouldn't sign your thing for nothing in the world. Hey, man, that ball player don't care if there's heat in your house or food on your table. Hey, that movie star, that singer that you think, hey, they don't give a rip about you, but God gave you a preacher to keep you out of hell. Thought I'd say that right there. He ought to be your hero. Because he'll be there when you need him. But how awful would it be to miss God holding the hand of your hero? I give invitations and I watch children. They absolutely, they absolutely slip up so close to their parents. They're under conviction, condemnation of God's on them, and they're trying their best to get, get closest to the person they think will make them safe. I watch, stand up, Bubba. I watch, I watch boys and girls, that girlfriend standing beside that boyfriend, that condemnation of God, and she'll run that arm and hold on for dear life. I've watched children absolutely get under the coattail of their daddy, thinking it'd make them feel better. And I tell you, the only thing going to take the condemnation of sin off of you is the blood that they just sang about and faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus. Amen. You think if I could just get, I watch wives hold their husband's hands and a husband's hold on. I'm talking about grown men's men. I'll tell you what, the strong men, I mean men of courage, men of strength. I watch them put their big hand on that little feeble wife's hand or that's born again and hold on because they think if they're close enough, they'll be all right. But his proximity was underestimated. He thought because he was close, he was all right. Don't be that close and miss God. Because Brother Jason is not promoting Brother Jason. Brother Jason is trying to get you to Jesus. Thank you. Good Proximity that was underestimated, problem that was urgent. What about this, Brother Larry? What about all them people that were unaware? I don't see not one of those disciples, not one of them, made one effort to get out of the boat to help Peter. Amen. They were unaware what was going on. 
Brother Jared, pray, God lets you sing. And man, be in front of all these people and preach it everywhere. Man, let God, let the Lord, let him move in your heart so you can be aware spiritually of what's going on. God's blessed you. And man, what a difference we can make for the glory of God. But if we're unaware, they're watching it. You better believe every one of their eyes were watching Peter walk. Ever, you couldn't appeal their eyes off what was going on. But when he began to, it wouldn't take me long. It wouldn't take Joan alone to start to sink till you would have piled out of a boat to go after Jonah or Ava, would it? And you've been on the water enough to know what it would look like. Those were fishermen in that boat. And I wonder who's drowning tonight. And we're just unaware. Some of you can't wait till we get the invitation. You may, I'm, I know he's preaching to me, but I'm leaving. I'm getting out of here. That's the wrong direction. That's right. Amen. There's a problem that was urgent. Hey, I know this is camp meeting, and this ain't camp meeting preaching. This is revival preaching. I mean, I understand that. But I'd rather go back to the motel tonight and lay down with the approval of God, the Holy Ghost on me. I'll just be honest with you. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. But there was a person that understood. Yes. Thank you, Lord. As soon as Peter said, Lord, save me. Yes. Peter didn't have to, there wasn't a whole bunch of hoops he had to jump through. Just as soon as he cried out, the Bible said, immediately. Immediately. He had saved you so fast your head would spin. You wouldn't know what's going on. Some of you get saved if you'd bow your will where you are would come. God would save you before you ever got to an altar. One of my best friends, he was sitting on the front pew one night and before he could get to the mourner's bench, which was two steps, he said, Brother Mark, God saved me before I laid my head on the mourner's bench. Say what happened, he bowed his will and surrendered to God. Come on back to the piano, Brother Jared. Three illustrations and I'm done. My, there was a little restaurant up in Helen, toward Helen that we would go eat on Sunday afternoons after church. And Carter was a baby. My Lisa was a baby. So Riley would have probably been Two and a half years old. And they had outside of that restaurant, they had a little koi pond. And Riley, he loved, he was about two and a half, 30 months old, 32 months old. And he loved, we'd wait on his mom to go to the bathroom. I'd have the boys out there. Or maybe mom was changing Carter's diaper and me and Riley were standing there. And Riley would get right up to the edge and put his feet up against those rocks and bend over and watch them fish go by. He'd squat way down and watch them. And them koi fish would come swimming around that pond. And all of a sudden, one of them fish swam right beside the edge of that wall. And when it did, it came close enough to Riley, he thought he could touch it. And he stuck his hand and before he knew it, he had fell in. And underneath that water he went. Now, he could have stood up in that water and been all right. But he didn't realize that. Come here, Bubba. Come here and help me. I ain't going to hurt you. Lay down on your back. Lay it on your back. I'll never forget, I was standing on the side. I was going to see what he was going to do. And I'll never forget when Riley turned over on his back with his eyes open and that sheer look of terror on his face. He knew he was in trouble. And there wasn't a thing he could do about it. And there I am in my suit 
Sunday shoes and everything. You say, what'd you do? I stepped down in that water. I reached and got him and I pulled him out. I mean, I'm, I'm knee deep in the water in a pair of floor shine, wing tip shoes, in a suit and a pair of colored socks. Hey, but I didn't give a rip what I had on or what I had to do. I had a boy that I loved, somebody that I cared for, was about to drown and I crawled off where he was and I took a big hand and I stuck it down in some cold water and I pulled him out. Amen. Amen. He was at arm's length. But had I not stepped off in that water, my little 32-month-old boy would have drowned where he was at. He was close to help. But he could have drowned had I not come to his rescue. You say, how easy is it to drown? It's real easy to drown. Yes, sir. I, could, I could call a certain name family, a preacher's family. I know Brother Jared know him. Many of you would know him. Several children in that family, the oldest one God called to preach, late 80s. And man, his daddy was a, as a fireball preacher, still is, pastors down in Georgia. And God called its oldest boy to preach. And man, God was opening doors and he was preaching everywhere. And he got married and they started having a family. And all of a sudden, some sickness came. And through that sickness, that young man got hooked on medication. And that sent that young man into a tailspin. And it was a, it was a, it was a certain kind of illness that never would go away and he, he dealt with that and ended up losing his family lost his wife and lost his son and he lived so bad that his own son when he got married and had his own child and he was a, that young man was now a grandfather that his boy didn't even want his boy to be around him a preaching daddy now he's got a preaching brother. Family's full time serving God. Mom used to sing like a bird. All right there to help him. Remember his brother said he came in off the road one night preaching and started to unload the family and get them in the house. And just as soon as they walked in, his telephone rang. And it was his dad. He said, son, we're over here at your brother's. And and said, nobody's seen him in two or three days and we're over here to check on him. And the paramedics are here and the police and we're, trying, we're breaking in to check on him. And that preaching brother, that young man that used to be a man of God, he said he heard his sister scream in the background. Daddy's gone! He said he walked in there and there lay his son that had OD'd on that medicine. Laid there for two or three days dead. A preaching daddy, a preaching mother, a God-fearing sister, all at arm's length and would have helped him. But he drowned in arm's length of help. But you don't have to. Said his brother, said it was so bad, Brother Lair. His brother preached his funeral and said when they rolled the casket down because the body had so decayed, the embalmers couldn't do a whole lot with it. And he said, honest before God, Brother Mark, he said when they, when they rolled the casket down, he said, I could smell the body. But he didn't have to die like that. You say, preacher, I'm close to help. Do I have to die like that? Oh, no. We were in Alabama, brother. Jared and I were in a meeting in Alabama, Roanoke, Alabama. One night, I just, out of the blue like I do, and I appreciate, I appreciate, let me just say this too, if you young preachers see me come up and go down, I wouldn't do that if your pastor didn't give me liberty. 
So don't you go somewhere and try to do that because I wouldn't do it if that man of God didn't give me permission. He's the pastor, not me. Amen. Amen. But that preacher just gave me, matter of fact, I pretty much moderated that service. And one night I got to exhort on the prodigal son. And I was a preacher, and I, I mean, man, God just put it on me to preach, and I was preaching. And all of a sudden, a young man, one of the, preach, the pastor's preacher boys come and got up on the platform, whispered to the preacher. And uh, I wondered what, they got all happy, and they was praising God, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And he said later on, we got to, in a meeting we found out, when that, pre, that young man walked up on the porch, that church in Alabama was in an old, in an old mill village. And said when he walked up on the porch that night to come into church, he, was, he just happened to be late. You'll get a hold of that in a minute. He just happened to be late. And Brother Ronnie said when he walked up, there was about a 15-year-old boy with his head up against the church door listening to me preach. He said, son, why don't we come on in the church? Why don't we go on in the church? And he said, I can't go. He said, my mama told me. She said, I could come up here, but I couldn't go in because I'd probably make a scene, so I can't go in that church. She told me I could come up here, but I couldn't go in. He was 60 foot from an altar, close to hell. Thank God that preacher didn't just give up. He said, son, have you ever been saved? He said, no, sir, I haven't. And he said, wouldn't you like to get saved like that preacher's preaching that you're listening to? He said, I sure would. And that preacher took his Bible and showed him how he could get saved. He said, son, do you want to get saved? He said, I sure do. And he said he walked off the porch over there to a light pole in the parking lot. And he said the old boy knelt at the bottom of a light pole, repented of his sin, and got born again. Hey, one man died in arm's length to help. But thank God you could be like that little boy. His mama said he couldn't go in, but thank God his mama might have said no, but Jesus said yes. Amen. Amen. You don't have to die you don't have to drown in arm's length of help see the help you need your parents can't give it to you as much as I wish I could I can't but I've talked to personally today the man who can yes sir You say, what are you going to do if nobody gets saved tonight? You're going to think you're an idiot preaching like that on a Wednesday night of a camp meeting. I learned a long time ago, the results were up to him. The delivering of the message was up to me. And you don't have to drown. Arm's length. Reach out there. Arm's length. Arm's length. That's how close you can be and still miss it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. As the pastor of Haynes Baptist Church, I want to thank you today for watching the video. If God's dealt with your heart today, we don't want to end without giving you an opportunity to be able to receive Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. I want you to understand no matter where you are in life today, that God sent His Son to die on the cross for your sin. The Bible tells us for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. But the Bible does tell us very clearly how God loved us so much. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The amazing thing is, though, after that, that God continued on to begin to talk about His love and what the purpose of Christ was, because the Bible says in verse number 17, For God sent not a Son into the world, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Today, if God's dealing with your heart and the Holy Spirit has told you that God wants to be able to save you through his son, Jesus Christ, and today what you must do is repent of your sins, realize that you are lost and on your way to hell. And if you are desperate, just like throughout all the Bible, throughout all the days and many of us that's in church today, there's only one way to be able to come to God, and that's through Christ his son. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven 
given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, as the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon them, the Lord shall be saved. If you're lost today, would you trust Christ as your Savior? Would you repent of your sins, die to yourself, live for Christ, and let God do something in your life that you've never seen? If you've done this today and you make this decision, please call our church office at 788-0551 so we can make a record of this and we'll be praying for you. Thank you so much.